Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. And as you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for, Lord, just this awesome morning to be able to know what it is to raise up our children in the ways that they should go, to be the example, to know that you've made a promise with us that you will take care of them, that you'll guide them. And so, God, we thank you that all of us have a part to play. All of us have a part for this next generation. And so, God, I thank you that today we'll begin to see that and to see what our part is and what we can do to contribute to help that come to pass. So we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, this morning is really just kind of a standalone message. Uh, We just came out of a series. And so uh, how many of you know that God's making some shifts? Have you been feeling God do that in your life? Amen. I know that he has. And so today I just want to take a little bit of a different direction before we start up a new series. But I want to first draw your attention to a man by the name of George Washington Carver. Uh, His story always just really blesses me. And to know about him, you know, he was born in uh, the 1860s. He was actually born into slavery. And he grew to be an educated man. He became a botanist. And as a result of just his contributions, you know, the South was in a bad way. And based upon what he discovered or what he discovered in some particular areas, his discoveries and inventions really saved the South financially. The South was about ready to go under, but because of him, it turned the South around. And he's noted for this, to or excuse me, 105 different ways to prepare peanuts for human consumption. He also discovered over 300 uses from the peanut by simply using different parts of it that includes ink, coffee, axle grease, bleach, shaving cream, and wood stain, and obviously uh, uh, 290 some other ones, right? He just began to learn and discover what the peanut could be used for. And as a result of those discoveries, it saved the South. But here's how he began to save the South or how he began to have that information. He had a heart to see people's lives change. He, He had a heart to see that this current generation didn't fizzle out but that it had the ability to pass on to future generations and see that they thrive and that they flourish and so George Washington Carver he he was known to be a man of God and so he was praying one day and he says God I need to help people he says God will you show me the mysteries of the universe and he said God responded to him this way He said, your peanut brain isn't big enough to know the mysteries of the universe. And then he says, okay, God. He said, well, then will you show me the mystery of the peanut? And it was upon him making that prayer, saying, God, I want you to show me the mystery of a peanut to be able to help people and save future generations. And as a result of his prayer that was about people and a desire to help people, God revealed the mysteries of the peanut. And again, it saved the future generations of the South. How many of you know that God needs us to be people that will pray? I said God needs us to be people that will pray. If we're believers, if we're followers of Christ, God wants us to pray for people. He wants us to pray for future generations. He wants us to be able to pray for our community. He wants us to be able to pray for our families. And just like George Washington Carver, when he asked for the mystery of the peanut, God revealed it to him. And you might say, God, help me know what it is that's going on with my family. Well, if you don't ever pray for your family, you don't ever express your heart for that that family member or that loved one. And so to think that God's going to talk to you about them, He's not going to gossip. He wants us to sincerely have a heart for those people. And upon having that heart for those people, God will begin to reveal things that will help you begin to pray for them. Does that make sense? I mean, think about it for this matter. You know, uh, you might have uh, two different kinds of, of kids in your family. One that just is so excited for Christmas. And, and so, you know, it might be October. And so when October comes, the one child starts telling you, oh, mom, dad, I want this, I want this, I want this. And they got the list. And they say, you can find it here. And starting in October, man, they're letting you know, this is is what I want. 
Well, as a result of what they're expressing of the desire of their heart, you know what they're sincerely wanting, right? Or you know what's in them. But then if that other child doesn't ever say a word, and you say, well, what do you want? And say, well, um, well, um, well, I guess I just want this. Well, if, if you have to coax all of them or try to get their attention or try to find out or dig what they really want, and all they ever do is tell you when you ask them, but they never talk about it any other time, do you think that they really want it? No. Because if they really wanted it, they would express it through their words, correct? And so again, when it comes to us praying and asking God for direction and helping us how to pray, he wants to know that your heart's in the game. He wants to know that, hey, listen, I sincerely want to pray for my family, pray for my spouse, pray for my church, pray for my community, and not just have a gossip session. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You get those people in church, they'll say, you know, come on, we need to pray for Ed. We need to pray for Ed. Well, what do we need to pray for Ed? Well, let me tell you what he's doing. This is what's going on in Ed's life. And what they end up doing is gossiping about Ed, and they disguise it by saying, let's pray. And all they really wanted to do was gossip. You know what I'm talking about? God wants to know that our heart is sincere when it comes to praying. And so when it comes to praying, uh, James, he says this in verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 3, it says, You have not because you ask not, or you ask amiss. So in other words, God's wanting to do things in our family. He's wanting to do things in our church. He's wanting to do things in our community. He's wanting to do things in our nation, in our political structure, if we'll simply pray. But he says, you have not because you ask not or you ask amiss. So that must mean that there is a right way or we can know how to pray, correct? And if we can know how to pray correctly, then doesn't it just make sense that God will give us direction in how we should pray or what we should pray for? I want God's best. I want God to give me direction when it comes to prayer. But God needs us to pray. I said, God needs us to pray. In John chapter verse 17 Jesus said this he said I've not come into the world to condemn the world but that the world through me might be saved and so that word saved is not just eternal life it means healing it means preservation it means protection it means deliverance and it means provision so in other words, God's saying this, I didn't come to condemn you or make you feel guilty or, or to make you feel shameful about your life. I've come that you might have health and healing. I've come that you might have protection. I've come that you might have provision in your life. And I've also come that you'd have everlasting life. He said, but that's what my desire is for you. And so when it comes to the heart of God, we know that as we pray, God can begin to do more in their lives than what we can just simply see on the surface. God wants to meet their needs when it comes to health and healing. He wants to meet their needs when it comes to provision, right? What about yourself? I talked about this in the, in, in the, the, the team meeting before we got started. Your prayer life has a boomerang effect. Many times we get so caught up praying for ourselves. God, I want, God, I need. God, I want, God, I need. But God needs us to pray for other people. And the Bible says this, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So that means that if I start sowing prayer towards somebody else, praying for their needs, that boomerang of prayer is going to come back and slap me. I'm praying for Kyle. Kyle is getting married here in just a matter of a few months, right? So I'm praying for Kyle. Lord, bless his marriage, bless his, his relationship in Jesus' name. Well, as I'm purposing to pray for him, what's going to happen to me? God's going to start seeing, to, man, you're praying for somebody else because you love them, you want to see their marriage grow. What's going to happen in my marriage? It's going to start getting better. He's going to start working on my behalf. Somebody comes and says, Pastor, man, I'm really having a, a dis difficulty in my finances. Well, let's pray. Well, what's God going to do for me? He's going to start helping me out financially because my prayers are not selfishly uh, uh, driven. They're praying for somebody else. So God desires for us to be people of prayer. God needs us to pray. John Wesley said this. He said, it seems as though God cannot move on the behalf of mankind unless somebody prays. And you say, well, why is that? Because the Bible says that God knows what we have need of before we ask. So we've got to ask him. God's desiring to move in our life, but we need to ask. Are you there in Daniel? 
in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 12. Just to kind of give you a little bit of a backdrop concerning this story, Daniel was praying for God's people. He was praying for Israel as a nation. He, he was saying, God, you need to move on their behalf. God, we need to have our hearts turned towards you. God, I'm praying for these people. So his heart was not to pray for himself selfishly, but to pray for those that God had a plan for, that God wanted to move in their lives. And so in Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 12, as he was praying, the Bible tells us that the angel Gabriel came and talked to him. Wouldn't it be great when you're talking to the Lord about some things and he just sends the angel Gabriel to talk to you, sends you a message? Wouldn't that be cool? You might think so. It might scare you half to death thinking, oh, dear God, what's up with that, man? <laughs> well, you realize, you know, angels always showed up and they always said, fear not. It would probably, you know, probably startle you a little bit, right? So in verse 12, it says, the angel Gabriel says, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia with, withstood me for 21 days, and behold, Michael, another angel, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. So there's a couple of things there that I want you to, to see. Once again, Daniel was praying for Israel. And upon him praying, the Bible says that the angel Gabriel came and talked to him about his prayer. A couple of things that I want you to see here. It says, first of all, the angel says, the moment that you set your heart to understand. What's understanding? Wisdom, direction, clarity. So he wanted some direction from God. The moment that you set your heart to understand and then humbled yourself before God, he said, your words were heard and he sent me. Come on, you got to understand that. The moment that you begin to pray, God starts moving on your behalf. I want you to hear that. I said, the moment that you pray, you begin to pray in faith, God starts moving. Are you here? He says, the moment that you prayed, God began to send me with an answer. Have you ever felt like your prayers were going unheard? Well, why is it? Did you notice that the Bible says that once you prayed, he said, in fact, I've come, I've come to hear your words, or it was your words that, that pulled me. So what's the words that he's praying? Faith-filled words. Those are the words that move God. You can be praying and boo-hooing all day long and it don't move God. But what moves God? Faith moves God. And he says, I've come for your words. Your words is what's got my attention. And I came because of those words. But then as he's praying, it says this, that the prince of Persia, really what it's talking about is demonic activity or a spiritual host. He says, they withstood me for 21 days. He says, your prayer came the moment or your answer was coming the moment that you prayed, but there was hindrances that came. So have you ever felt like it took a while for your prayers to get answered? Well, why would you think, well, dear God, God's not hearing me. God must not care. Well, maybe it's just that your prayers got hindered because the moment you started praying and you said, God, I need you to move on behalf of my family. I need you to move on behalf of my church. And God, it doesn't seem like anything's happened. Those type of prayers are the prayers that the enemy doesn't want you to pray. And the moment you start praying them, the enemy comes to withstand you. So don't think about it as though God's not answering. Just begin to say, well, God, I know that there's some hindrances here. I thank you that, Lord, he's moving out of the way. Right. And here's the thing. Many times when it comes to our prayers and we find ourselves struggling when it, when it comes to receiving from God, or just those battles of our life, and when we're praying, we're thinking, God, what's going on? I don't feel like I'm in a good place with you, or God, I don't feel like you're answering my prayers like I, like I think you should. Many times, the, the, the frustration that we feel, well, let me say it this way. Many times, we find ourselves being under condemnation or guilt or shame because the things of the past. And therefore, the enemy is real good at pointing out the past and saying, that's why your prayers aren't getting answered. I'm here to submit to you this morning that many of the times it's not the battle of the past, but it's the battle of the future. Because the enemy sees what the future is, and he's battling you because of that. But he wants to remind you of the past and make you put your attention on the things in the past and say, well, that's why it's not happening. No, I'm telling you what, God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life, and it's good things. 
and God desires to move. Amen? So God needs us to pray. He needs us to pray in order for God to move. And if you think about it, when we purpose to humble ourselves, in fact, if you remember, it says, when you sought to understand and humble yourself before God, I began to move. How is it that we purpose to seek to understand? How is it that we humble ourselves before God? Well, the Bible says this, at the entrance of your word brings light. Remember, he says, from the first, you set your heart to understand. Well, if you was to come into this building, what's the first thing that you do? You go through the entrance, right? So in other words, there's a protocol of coming into this building, and it's going through the entrance or the door. And the Bible says that the word of God is the entrance, or the entrance of his word brings light or brings understanding. So he says, when you purpose, or at first purpose to humble yourself, to know God's will and God's desire, I moved. How do you know God's will, God's desire, God's purpose? It is his word. So how is it that we humble ourselves? Purposing to know what God says about our circumstance, our situation, what it is that we're praying for. Now here's again another tactic of the enemy is that he'll say, well, you know what? You don't know a whole lot of Bible. You haven't memorized the Bible. You don't know a whole lot. In fact, when you try to read the Bible, it don't make sense. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Now, many times the reason we don't understand is because we read it in goofy ways. You know, we flip through it, stop it, point in a verse and say, okay, I'm going to read that verse. It don't make any sense. Well, you don't know the whole context of what you're purposing to read. You try to pick out one isolated verse and try to make sense of it. I had somebody call me on the phone just the other day. He says, hey, can you tell me what Ecclesiastes whatever, or Exodus, whatever it was? I'm like, I'm not there. I don't have my Bible in front of me. And so you're pulling out an isolated scripture. So no, I don't really know what that means. Sorry. <laughs> well, I thought you was a, a, a pastor. Well, it don't matter. It's a big book, a lot of verses in there. <laughs> I'd have to read it just like you to kind of get the understanding of that one verse. And so there's the right way to begin to read the Bible that makes understanding. But once we purpose to give ourselves to the Word of God, it begins to make sense. And the enemy says, oh, you just don't understand because of how it's written. Listen, part of your understanding or lack of understanding is because you go into it expecting not to understand. And you've said that over yourself time and time. Well, I just never, never understand what I'm reading. It just don't make sense to me. It is, I read it, and it is, I sit there like a cow at a new gate. It's like, I don't understand, right? Well, so based on what you've said, you've already set up your expectations to not understand. So when you purpose to read, just simply say, God, I thank you that you're talking to me. And that at the entrance of your word, it brings light, and I'm beginning to humble myself before you, and it makes sense. Amen. Amen. And so then the word of God can begin to open up understanding to us. But let me help you just see some things here for the simplicity of the Word of God. Many of you learned this verse as a, as a child in Sunday school. John 3, 16, right? They hold it up in the football games. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that who would ever believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we end up saying that or reciting that as though it's just kind of a nursery rhyme. But if we would really begin to just chew on that, meditate on that verse, just take that to work with you, just say it over yourself, say it out loud, think about it when you're driving in the car, for God so loved the world. That verse alone would put you over in life. That scripture alone would bring such understanding if you would allow God to talk through, to you through it. What am I saying? For God so loved the world. So in other words, so God loved me. God loved you. So God so loved me. Man, he loves me. I mean, he loves me so much that he sent Jesus to die for me. He loves me. Oh, my goodness, he loves me. He loves me so much he sent Jesus for me. I mean, if you start chewing on that, it would eliminate the pity party, wouldn't it? Come on, are you seeing how the word of God begins to open up? Just one verse and just a couple words of that verse. For God so loves me. Wow, I mean, I don't have to feel sorry for myself anymore because it doesn't matter who don't love me. I mean, the one that really matters loves me. Right. I mean, and he, he sent his son for me. Well, wait a minute now, wait a minute. If God really loves me that much and he sent Jesus for me, Jesus is the very best that God has, and he gave Jesus for me. 
I mean, he gave me his best. He didn't give me second best. In fact, he didn't try to find a, a goat or a calf or a dove or anything to make sacrifice like they used to. He gave me Jesus to be my substitute, the very best. Jesus left heaven to come and die for me. Wow, he really loves me. Well, wait a minute now. If he gave me his best, why do I struggle so much and wonder if God won't help me in my job, in my physical body, in my marriage? Well, wait a minute. God gave me his best, and I didn't even have to ask for it. So if he'll give me his best, surely he'll give me the desire of my heart if it lines up with his will. Right? Come on, are you seeing how all of a sudden... I just feel a whole lot better for myself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, God, I believe in you. I believe in you. And you said that I wouldn't die. I wouldn't perish prematurely. Man, I don't have to die before my time. I don't have to have cancer. I don't have to get sick. I don't have to get this or that. I don't have to get hit by a train. I have protection of God because I'm loved. I'm loved by him and I believe in him. And he said, I wouldn't perish. So that means I can live long. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 91, he says, with long life will he satisfy you. If you're 100 years old and you're not satisfied, and keep on living. Amen. And God will back you up. Amen. I don't have time to get into that one, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Are you here this morning? Amen. I've got long life because he loves me. He gave his son for me. And he, said, and he says, I would have everlasting life. Well, yeah, you know, that's just eternal life. Well, eternal life begins the moment that you receive Christ, right? So don't let the enemy dupe you into thinking, well, that's just when you get to heaven. No, eternal life starts the moment you receive Christ. So that means, oh, praise the Lord. That means I can experience the goodness of life. Oh, not just living and breathing with just a decrepit body and a decrepit way of living, but no, I can live life to the fullest. In fact, that's what we say around here, loving God, loving people, and loving life. Why? Because God has come and sent Jesus because he loved me to give me everlasting life. I don't have to wish for death because it's so crummy. I can live life because it's so great because I serve a great God. Amen. Come on, you can meditate on that, what we seem to think as a children's verse, and get happy about it. And faith could come. And from that one verse, you could pray for the moon. Again, hypothetically speaking, I could pray for God to move on my behalf and know that he would do it because John 3.16 says that God loves me. Come on, are you tracking with me this morning? God wants us to live by the word of God. He wants us to purpose to pray according to his word. Now, I'm running out of time, so we're going to make this a two-parter. Is that all right? We didn't get into the whole praying side, so we're going to make that next week. But he wants us to live by the word of God. And therefore, the word of God becomes our standard. Remember, he says, when you first sought God to humble yourselves, as we begin to humble ourselves to the word of God, we begin to start making the word of God first place in our life. Come on, church. We need to be a people that gets back to reading the Bible. We have been a church that has gotten so lazy well, I'll just listen to it on tape. I mean, that's good, but you need to read it. We've gotten so lazy that we don't even know where our Bibles are. Right? Well, I know the big one's on the coffee table. <laughs> well, where's mine? <laughs> we need to get back to being a people that identify with the Word of God. And as we begin to identify and put the Word of God in our heart, it becomes our standard. I said the word of God becomes our standard. We live in a society that we try to bend the word to conform to our ideals. But our ideals need to be conformed to the word of God. It says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? It's by the word of God. You know, I was talking with somebody the other day, and this is really the ideal of where the church has become. It has come to the place of where I can live life the way that I want to, and God's okay with that. In fact, you know, we were talking about some things and, and, and just kind of some things that we kind of find ourselves doing, and, and I said, well, I said, you know, the Word of God is really our standard. And then the response was, 
Well, if I'm mature or growing as a believer and mature as a believer, then I should be able to be mature enough to get through that, whatever I'm giving myself to. And I'm trying to be vague in just the examples. But the reality is, is that if I'm really growing and maturing and the Word of God becomes my standard, I'm not trying to get as close to the edge without sinning. The Word of God becomes my standard, and therefore, I try to get as far away from unrighteousness, right? Because you realize that if you get real close to the edge, it's slippery on the edge, and you'll slip in. Now, you may say, well, what does it mean to have the Word of God as the standard for my life? Let's just put it this way. The Bible says that the Word of God is God speaking to us, right? But the Bible also tells us that Jesus is close as the mention of his name. In fact, he can't get any more close to you as being on the inside of you if you're a Christ follower, if you've asked Christ into your life. So my question for you is, when we ask ourselves, what is permittable for life? If the Word of God becomes a standard in our life, what would you do or not do if Jesus was standing next to you? Because, again, we try to sugarcoat it and say, well, I'm mature enough. I know how to be around it and not do it. I know how to hang with them, but just, you know, kind of just hang with them. Right? But what if Jesus was in the room? What would you be watching on TV if Jesus was in the room? Well, I'm mature enough. I'm mature enough as a believer that if I watch that on TV, it's not going to affect me. Okay, let's ask the question. If Jesus was sitting on the couch with you, with you, would you be watching it? Well, you know, I just do it for medicinal reasons. <laughs> I've got my card. <laughs> it's all even Stephen. All right? Jesus is sitting next to you. How you feeling? <laughs> you get the point, Right? The places that we go, the people that we hang with, the things that we do. If Jesus was with us, what would we do? See, this is what I'm talking about as the Word of God being the standard for our lives. And that's where we're getting back to. That's what we need to come to. It's like, God, I'm going to seek you first. The Word of God is going to be my priority. And as I seek the Word of God, it is going to put me into a place of walking better and closer with you. Amen? Amen. Now, this is where I was saying before, as we begin to know the Word of God, it begins to help us pray. It will direct our prayers. It will help us pray correctly. Because remember, we started over in James uh, chapter 4, I believe it was, where it says, we have not because we ask not or we ask amiss. The Word of God will give you permission to know what to ask for. The Word of God will help you ask correctly and not miss the mark. Amen? And so I want to pray effectively. And I want us to begin to pray and see things happen in the midst of our church, in our lives, because we're walking closer with God. Amen? Come on, let's stand. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Praise God. Father, we have a desire to know you this morning. God, we, we just want to be pleasing to you. God, we want to know your voice. We want to know your presence. And God, we just want to receive everything that you desire for us and the fullness of what this Christian life is to look like. know that there's been hurt and there's been pain I know there's things that have happened in life that have scarred you and it seems like it's an, a constant open wound that never heals and as a result you run you try to medicate try to dull the pain 
and behind all the laughing and all the smiles there's really tears and there's really pain God's asking you right now are you ready to stop running because you can't run from the pain you can't run from the sorrow But if you'll run into his arms, you'll find that the pain can be healed. I realize that many times we think, well, God, I don't want to forget. You can still remember, but not have to deal with the pain. God wants to replace that pain with peace he wants to replace that sorrow with joy he wants to replace that bondage of the of that thing that holds itself to you and give you freedom now I don't know exactly who I'm talking to but if that just ministers to your heart I want you to understand God's talking to you right now and God wants you to be free and experience the life that he desires for you so I'm just going to pray right now and if you'll purpose to reach out and say God that was me I want to be free I want to be free from the pain and I want to experience peace once and for all it's coming to you right now Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for every person that's under the sound of my voice, for the person that that, that that is applicable to. God, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. That's what you've come to do. You said in the book of Luke, you said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that that pain is leaving and peace is replacing it. God, I thank you that the hurt is being replaced with comfort. And God, I thank you that right now the love of God fills and floods them from the top of their head, from the soles of their feet. And right now they stop running. They stop running. They stop running. They stop running. And God, they turn to you. And he says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be free. So if you're here this morning and you say, I just want to know Jesus. Just to yourself, you can pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Thank you for healing my pain. Thank you for removing the past. Thank you for a brand new life through Jesus Christ. I receive forgiveness. I receive freedom. Right now, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's a brand new day for somebody. Amen. Hello and welcome to Genesee Valley Church Online Campus. We're so glad that you've tuned in today. And I trust that what you've heard has been a blessing to you. You know, at the end of every service, we take the opportunity to minister to people, to pray for people, and most importantly, make sure that they're prepared for eternity. And so my big question for you today as you're watching, if you was to breathe your last today, would today be the day that you step over into eternity to spend it with Jesus? You might say, I hope so, or I think so, but hoping and thinking doesn't get you there. In fact, God, He gave us an answer to the solution to our sin problem, and it was Jesus. He sent Jesus and he died on the cross. He went to the grave and on the third day he rose from the grave. And through him we have eternal life. And the Bible says this, that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we shall be saved. And so I simply want to give you that opportunity today. If you've never made Christ the Lord of your life, or maybe you've walked with God and you feel like you're a million miles away and you would like to simply rededicate your life to the Lord, I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's very simple. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus, that he came and died on the cross for me, that he went to the grave, and on the third day, he arose. Jesus, 
Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my friend. In Jesus' name, amen. It's just that simple. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. And listen, if we can help you in that journey, we want to be a support system to you. You know, there's a number or some contact information at the bottom of the screen. If you'll get a hold of us, we'll send you some information just to help you on this journey as you begin your life walking with Jesus. Also in that journey, it's so important to get involved with a local church. So if you're in our area, come pay us a visit. We'd be glad to see you and purpose just to love on you as best as we can. Maybe you're somewhere else. Let us know. We'll help you get connected to a great church that will love you and support you and help you in this journey. Amen. Hey, listen, at Genesis Valley Church, we always say we love God, love people, and love life. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. God bless.